Last time on Powering New Zealand, we discovered the great pioneers that got us going as world leaders in hydroelectricity. Now we see the government get involved and the world leading projects keep coming. In our last episode, we briefly mentioned a guy by the name of Fletcher. He was a key part of the Bullendale story, but he was also the critical link to how the government got involved. So now we talk about Robert Ernest Fletcher. And Fletcher immigrated uh, from England to New Zealand about 1885, and he set up the Fletcher & Co electrical contracting company in Dunedin with, of course, Walter Prince. And he also trained at Anglo-American Brush Electric Light Corporation with Prince. It was all getting a bit incestuous, Dave, wasn't it? Yeah, a little bit, but this was the really early days of the electricity industry, so it's, it's not that surprising that they knew each other. But anyway, Fletcher and co. were contracted to install the electrical equipment at Bullendale, and they managed to source that Victoria motor, which was installed at the Phoenix mine. But the Victoria machine they secured wasn't a motor, it was a generator, actually designed for powering incandescent lighting, which had recently been invented. So the Victoria lighting generator somehow ended up being the motor, powered by the new Bullendale hydro plant over the hill, to run the Phoenix mine stamping battery. To understand how this all came about, let's get the backstory from Professor Reeve. So before there was efficient lighting like LEDs and halogens, we had incandescent and arc lighting. Incandescent lighting was actually first in 1820, and they would heat a filament up white hot and it would glow brightly. Now, having things at white heat in the atmosphere is hard on materials, so they had to use really expensive materials like platinum, and that makes for a very expensive light bulb. So lighting wasn't practical until 1878, when the American Charles Brush came up with the arc lighting system. Now, arc lighting uses two carbon electrodes to come together and to form an arc, and it glows really brightly, a bit like arc welding or lightning. It's really bright, but it was quite expensive, but it was still used in street lighting and in commercial buildings. And then just after that, two men, Joseph Swan and more famously Thomas Edison, came up with a cheap filament inside a vacuum inside a glass bulb. And with the cheap, practical, incandescent light, electric lighting swept the world. So American Charles Brush invented the practical arc lighting system. Now his company made high voltage DC generators that could send power quite a long way, normally used for street lighting. But it had been known for a while that you could actually use a generator as a motor, but in practice it didn't work very well. They would arc and they wouldn't run very well and they'd run inefficiently. There was, however, one exception. The Brush Victoria Dynamo did run well as a motor, but it was used for incandescent lighting and so it was low voltage and relatively low power. If it was going to be used at Bullendale, it would need to be modified. So the story goes that the Suez Canal requested a large electric motor. And the only way they could get one big enough was to modify a dynamo. So they modified this dynamo, which is known as a Victoria dynamo, and they converted it to a motor at 2000 volts running very high power. In fact, they created a monster. But how in 1885 did a motor ordered for the Suez Canal end up in Bullendale? Well, apparently the order was cancelled and so it became available for George Bullen's electrification project. And Robert Fletcher completed the conversion here in New Zealand and he installed the motor at Bullendale. And it ran 41 kilowatts. That's about the power of a small car. Yeah, and purpose-built motors of the time were only getting up to seven and a half kilowatts. In fact, they needed both arc dynamos to run it. It may actually have been the largest electric motor in the world for the five years it was in operation until 1891. Which is pretty impressive given that electrical power had only been used just for lighting for about eight years, and they're only just starting to get to electric motors. It wasn't all smooth sailing for Fletcher though. He spent a great deal of his own money to get the machines running, then after Prince had his accident, it was left entirely up to him to deliver the project. Unable to keep up, Fletcher was driven to bankruptcy. It would be the father and son team of the Evanses that would get the Victoria Special up to full power. Once out of bankruptcy, Fletcher turned his hand to gold dredges, which were a New Zealand invention and had been operating in New Zealand since the 1860s. By the 1880s, they were powered by coal and steam engines. 
The Sandhills Gold Dredging Company was almost as remote as Bullendale, being further up the Shotover River from Skipper's Downship, and carting coal into the claim was an expensive and logistical challenge. With the high profile projects of Bullendale and Reefton in full swing, the Sandhills operators wondered if hydroelectricity might be for them as well. Enter our man Fletcher, who was contracted to provide the power plant, which he did, this time successfully. By 1890, Sandhills had the first electricity powered gold dredge in the world. The Sandhills gold dredge was highly productive and the company's energy costs fell almost to zero. Near the peak in 1903, the number of gold dredges on the Clutha, Kaurau and Shotover rivers reached 201. Yep, by the start of the 20th century, New Zealand knew as much about electricity and especially hydro as any country in the world. By now, Richard Seddon's government was keen to get in on the action, and it chose Rotorua as its guinea pig town. Already an international tourist destination, the government believed using electric lighting would increase Rotorua's tourism appeal. It also sought to run the new local sewerage plant using electric motors. And once again, it was Robert Fletcher who was called to duty. First to advise the Public Works Department on the project, and then to install the electrical equipment. He chose this site. Akiri Falls on the Kaituna River, commissioned in 1901, was one of the first government-built hydroelectric power stations in the world. It was the success of the Akiri Falls project which convinced the government that hydroelectricity had a big role to play in building the country. They resolved the majority of New Zealand's electricity projects would come from state coffers and the New Zealand people would only build hydroelectric power stations. This was a policy that survived successive governments until 1958. Robert Fletcher died on the 17th of September 1935 in Auckland and was honoured by a glowing obituary by the New Zealand Institute of Engineers. The obituary quite rightly noted his significant contribution to the projects that made such a difference to both New Zealand and Australia. He constructed the first hydroelectric power station in Australia as well. He was Chief Engineer at the Melbourne Exhibition. He was Chief Electrical Engineer at the Hobart Exhibition. He was a senior manager at three iconic New Zealand engineering firms. And of course, he installed the electrical machinery at Sand Hills, here at Akiri Falls and Bullendale. Now Dave, I've got Fletcher's obituary here and it does not mention Bullendale anywhere. What's going on? Well, it's not that hard to understand why he might not have liked Bullendale that much. I mean, his friend was injured there and they were friends at the time and that put intense work pressure on him. He had to follow up with the contract and then he was made bankrupt and there was legal action over that and then he was dumped from the contract. So it's not hard to understand why Fletcher may not appreciate Bullendale very much. For us though, this is the genesis of our love affair with Hydro, so he's really important to us. So what do you reckon? Pretty impressive guy? Yeah, I think we should put him up there on the board with his mate Walter Prince. But we have never been able to find a photo of Robert Fletcher, so this will just have to do. So let's just pause for a minute here, Dave. If you look at the Power Board of Fame as we have it now, we have this random group of guys who came together around this crazy project to put the Southern Hemisphere's first hydro power station in the middle of the back blocks of beyond. Not completely random, because Fletcher and Prince did know each other. They worked together for some years. Yeah, fair enough. I guess my point is, is that Bullendale, which was an international achievement in itself, then became a springboard for New Zealand to go on with these guys and do a bunch of other amazing things. I mean, there was Reefton, which was first town to be lit by electric light in the Southern Hemisphere. There was Sandhills, which was the world's first electrically powered dredge. And then there was Akiri Falls, which was one of the Southern Hemisphere's first state-built hydro power stations. Yeah. These guys really were the match that lit the spark to a century-long fascination with renewable energy and led to us having one of the most enviable renewable energy systems in the world today. We really are amazing guys. So sticking with the Akiri Falls story, there's another person who deserves to be on our Power Board of Fame that was the Chief Engineer of the Public Works Department when Akiri Falls was built. His name is Peter Seton Hay. Now Hay was born in Glasgow but came out to New Zealand when he was just a kid. Now one of the interesting things about Peter Seton Hay is that in 1877 he was the second graduate of New Zealand's first university, 
which was the University of Otago, and he graduated there with a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics. Hay fell into a job with the Works Department in 1875, where he was deployed all around Otago on survey work for the new railway lines. He soon gained a reputation for being able to solve difficult calculations in his head, which made him really useful on remote field work. Hay's intellect saw him oversee seven critical new viaducts, and by 1896 he was dedicating significant resources to surveying New Zealand's lakes and rivers. By 1901, California was also at the forefront of hydroelectricity, and a guy by the name of L. M. Hancock, who was an expert in the Californian hydro projects, was invited down under to assess our hydro potential. Hancock arrived in 1903 and Hay was chosen to support him. The two travelled from Wairua at the tip of the North Island to Monowai in the Deep South from October to December of 1903. Hancock's summary declared that New Zealand had an abundance of hydroelectric potential that should be developed. Now the more detailed report was left to Peter Hay and in 1904 the printed and bound report from Peter Hay was tabled in Parliament. Now, Hay's book is the seminal word in hydro catchments in New Zealand. It's still the first word and the starting point for every major hydroelectric scheme in New Zealand. Hay's conclusion about New Zealand, and I'll read it from this. There seems to be every reason to suppose that the gradual development of water power would accelerate the general industrial progress of the colony by providing a supply of cheap power, much cheaper than steam or other mode of power, and in a form to easily meet many varying conditions of service. Hayes' report recommended many sites, but number one was here at Lake Coleridge in the mainland. That was all the New Zealand government needed. Coleridge was first out of the blocks and New Zealand went on to become a hydroelectric powerhouse, a vision that didn't really end until the construction of Clyde in 1992, a scheme of course that was surveyed by Hancock and our man Hay. Hay became engineer in chief in 1906 but died in office the next year. He was inspecting the progress of work on the North Island main trunk line near Waiuru when he suffered from the severe cold. He contracted a lung infection and died of pleurisy on the 19th of March, 1907. It really is fitting that New Zealand's first homegrown engineer is also one of our greatest. It was thanks to Hay that we now have Coleridge, Arapuni, Benmore, Karapiru, Whakamaru, Tekapal, Clyde, Tokanu, and just about every other major hydro power station in New Zealand. So there you go, without Hay, we may not have all the hydro projects we have in New Zealand today. And that's why Hay needs to be up on our power board of fame. So our next hero's name is quite a mouthful, Frederick Templeton Mannheim Kissel. And he was born in Canterbury in 1881, and he went to your treasured Canterbury University, where he graduated in 1905. In his early career, Kissel was employed a number of jobs, including a stint at the Public Works Department working on the Arthurs Pass Railway. This is where he made the first survey of Lake Coleridge around 1906. After joining Selwyn County as engineer, he kept advocating for the Coleridge project to go ahead, and once the government committed to the project, Kissel was offered the lead role as engineer in charge back with the Public Works Department. As well as looking after the construction of the station, he was also eventually put in charge of the tunnelling work which had been beset by delays. The complexities of the college project can't be overstated. The power station behind me looks like it's built on solid ground. However, the station is built on river shingle gouged out from the action of glaciers. And this glacial debris is very deep and soft enough to make building foundations very difficult. And another big problem the project would have is that it would have long penstocks and that would make it susceptible to a phenomenon known as water hammer. Stop! Hammer time! Water hammer time. When you try and stop water moving quickly in a pipe, it can bounce up and down. That's what's known as water hammer. And one of these penstocks behind me holds 600 tonnes of water. So if you try and stop that quickly and it bounces, that's bad. Kissel and his team solved both engineering problems, and the solutions were adopted worldwide. And this in a project that suffered from some of the worst winter weather you could experience. And with no proper road access. On 15 November 1914, the first stage of Coleridge Power Station was opened at 4.5 megawatts. 
and Christchurch was the second city in New Zealand, after Rotorua, to get state-sponsored hydroelectricity. Coleridge had gone over time, and over budget, but due to the significant problems that had to be overcome to build it, it was hailed as an engineering success. Coleridge garnered international acclaim. In 1922, Kissel was sent overseas to investigate the latest in hydro technology. He returned in 1924 and was made Chief Electrical Engineer. His first job was to pick up the problematic Arapuni project, which started in 1922. Mungahau was commissioned in 1924 and Tuai in 1929. Now they were 20 megawatts and 32 megawatts respectively and they were considered large. But Arapuni was 84 megawatts. It was a giant. New Zealand's power consumption was a third of that. To build Arapuni, they had to hack penstocks through the rock on the side of the Waikato River. And if you want to know how much of an undertaking that was, take a look at the 237 steps behind me. It was commissioned in 1929, but by 1931 the rock on which it was built proved to be a big problem. The sandstone was actually quite porous and it saturated with water. The powerhouse leaned over, which is a very bad thing for a power station. The turbine casings cracked and Arapuni was shut down. They had to empty the head race and Kissel and his team came up with an ingenious way of waterproofing the whole thing and it lasted until 1989. So by 1932, Arapuni was running again. As well as Arapuni, by 1934 a number of other power stations had been completed and New Zealand had a large electricity surplus, which was the envy of the world at that time. By 1935, large-scale transmission was now well developed and extended over most of the North Island. And just before the war, the transmission lines met up interconnecting the major power stations of Arapuni and Mangahau. And the national grid was born. Between 1936 and 1939, electricity use increased by 50%. At the time, most people paid a fixed price using as much as they wanted. New Zealand quickly went from huge surpluses to severe shortages. Kissel was slow to admit there was a problem because he didn't believe demand would grow as fast as it did. But by the end of 1939, Kissel knew that electricity supply was a major issue and five new turbines were ordered from Europe. Unfortunately, World War II got in the way and only two machines were dispatched from Britain and they were torpedoed by a U-boat. Our power supply was in trouble and a lot of attention went on controlling demand or what is known as load control. During World War II, Kissel became the electricity controller responsible for the absolute control of generation, transmission, distribution, sale and the use of electric energy. It was under his watch that he was forced to administer electricity rationing, which he hated. He deeply regretted his pre-war views on demand growth. In addition to his extended duties, Kissel sought to make amends. In 1941, he proposed a 10-year plan to get almost 800 more megawatts from the Waikato River. In 1943 it was approved, and work began at Karapiro. Demand during the war was tightly controlled, and during this time, New Zealand adopted a Swiss approach to load control called ripple injection. This sounds like an ice cream, is, is that a tip-top flavour? Well at 230 volts, I wouldn't try licking it. No, ripple injection is a way of turning things on and off down the power lines, usually water heaters. See, in theory, you can use power lines for phone lines as well. They're both made out of copper wire, and they did this on the national grid until the 1990s. But in practice, power lines don't make very good phone lines, so we don't do it that way anymore. But it is good enough to send out a ripple of pulses down the lines, and this is what distribution companies do. They send a pulse, or what they call a ripple, down the lines, and it's the timing of these pulses that tells water heaters to switch on, switch off, or do nothing. We were an early adopter of this technology, but New Zealand also had another very simple solution. For decades, most New Zealand houses had a switch. This switch would control where the Kiwis could use their electric range, that's their oven, or their water heater. You could choose one or the other, but not both together. A remarkably simple but effective approach. There's your proverbial Kiwi fix using number eight, copper wire and it wasn't long before New Zealand again became a world leader, this time in load control. In 1945, Kessel became the first general manager of the newly formed State Hydroelectricity Department, 
although he retired soon after that in 1948. Kissel had had a tough time, but he'd fixed problematic Arapuni, delivered world-class Coleridge, and had been a key character in bringing hydroelectricity to New Zealand, a purpose about which he cared deeply. Despite needing to impose drastic rationing and restrictions during his career, he was well respected by colleagues and critics. He was admired for his vision, sense of humour and conscientiousness. So he died in Wellington in 1962, aged 82, and he's rightly regarded as a true pioneer of New Zealand's electricity system. So he's going up on the power board. We've seen the projects get bigger and more challenging. Next time we talk about the largest, most advanced and successful project of its time. We take the lead in geothermal and we discover that it's not just the big stuff at which New Zealanders excel.